Moving on tonight to today's tonight's speaker, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Michael W. R. Davis, who will present a program relating to his latest book, Detroit Area Test Tracks, which is about automotive uh, test tracks and proving grounds. In the 1920s, major automotive makers uh, moved from testing their vehicles on uh, public thoroughfares, like, as I said, Lake Shore Road and Jefferson, uh, to these test tracks. And for years, they were a source of curiosity because of the secrets behind the walls. And this goes beyond the walls and tells you about what, what went on on the test tracks and how they evolved. Mike was a big now speaker back in September of 2008 when he presented a program on the old General Motors, right? Uh, which just went out of business. But General Motors Centennial. Uh, and we're happy to announce that Mike will be coming back and talking about his next book, uh, which is going to be published in July about the St. Clair River. Mike is an author, a journalist, and a historian. He's also the author, I had down here seven books, and I had dinner with him, and you said 13 books, so we'll have to talk about that tonight. But the ones that I know about are America's Favorite Homes, 1990, The Ford Fleet, 1994, The Technology Century, which was the Engineering Society of Detroit's Centennial book in 1995, which, of which he was the contributor and the editor-in-chief, General Motors, a photographic history of what we just spoke of from 2008, our program 2008, Chrysler Heritage of Photographic History, uh, Ford Dynasty of Photographic History, and Detroit's wartime industry, the arsenal of democracy in 2007. He's currently uh, completing the aforementioned St. Clair book, and he's seeking a publisher for his story of an American medical unit in World War I. Your grandmother, right, was involved with that. Uh, tentatively entitled Forsaken Angels in Their Own Words. Mike earned a BA in American History from Yale in 1953, and MS in Cultural Ge uh, Geography and Historical Preservation from Eastern Michigan in 1983, and completed coursework for a doctoral in history of technology at Wayne State University. He's a former national director of the Pioneer America Society Association of, of the Preservation of Artifacts and Landscape of Past President of Algonquin Club of Detroit Windsor, of course, the Canadian American Club devoted to the history of the Great Lakes area. Former chairman of the board of the, of the uh, trustees of the National Automotive History Collection, the world's largest automotive literature collection, the Detroit Public Library, and former president of the alumni, uh, Yale Alumni Association of Michigan. He was a reporter for the Miami uh, Daily News and Business Week magazine, uh, their Detroit uh, Labor Bureau, Bureau uh, Chief, uh, or Assistant Chief, or Chief, I'm sorry, Assistant Chief, before spending 27 years as a public relations and marketing executive at Ford Motor Company and then the Evening News Association. Subsequently, he was, an, was the executive director of the Detroit Historical Society for five years, at which time he also served as the director of the University Cultural Center Association. Uh, he's been an adjunct professor of architectural history at Eastern University as a historian and regional director of the Defense Orientation Conference Association, a civil educational um, organization associated with the U.S. Department of Defense. As a freelance journalist, he's contributed to countless magazines, newspapers, and trade journals. As a scholar, he's made numerous presentations at universities and scholarly uh, meetings, and then less than scholarly meetings like ours today. Uh, and uh, he uh, also um, serves uh, on the advisory panel for nominations of the Automotive Hall of Fame and was elected as a uh, I was an elected board member for nine years of the Detroit chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. He's a member of the Automotive Press Association, Society of Automotive Historians, Sons of the American Revolution, Society of the War of 1812, Sons of the Union Veterans. You got a lot of military in your background, and your family background, and military order of the Loyal Legion of the United States. Mike was born May 10, 1931. Now everybody knows how old you are in Buffalo, New York, and grew up in Louisville, uh, and has been a resident of the Detroit area since 1957. Uh, he's also been a member of the Price Church Cranbrook. Uh, Church in Bloomfield Hills for more than 50 years, and has served as the uh, church as a church school teacher and a vestry member. Uh, Mike Davis, thank you. Good evening. I'm afraid Mike Skinner knows more about me than I know about myself, <laughs> or if forgot or should have been. As David Lewis always says, "Boy, I'd like to meet that man when I introduce him." <laughs> well, that's uh, that's the way I felt about one of my articles that was very thoroughly rewritten edited and made much better. And I wrote the editor and, and said, you know, I, I'm really pleased that I know the guy whose name is on this article. <laughs> well, good evening and thank you very much for having me here again. I always enjoy the, the trek over here from the north side, see how the other half lives. Uh, this book on test tracks got started uh, when I was volunteering at the National Automotive History Collection one October. Saturday afternoon sorting photographs. And I ran across a lot of photographs of the test tracks, uh, which as it happened in my checkerboard career, I had been on most of them. Uh, 
uh, and driven on. And I got to thinking that I don't think there's ever been a book on this subject, and I think there's a fair amount of interest, at least in the automotive community, on the one hand, and if you would like to change the advance the slide. Okay, here we go. Uh, fingers crossed. There we go, there we go. Who's the guy in the hat? I'll get to that. <laughs> in general, you know, the mystery of when you, when you have a, a big secret, a big public secret, that just excites all this curiosity. What's behind that wall? What's going on there? And I'm just as guilty of this in way. So I'm the guy in the uh, Bermuda shorts uh, with the hat. And my wife put that in 1958. And when I started to work on this book, I thought, if I could just find that, it would make a cute little introduction to the idea that people are curious about what's behind the wall. But this is really, as I got into it, it's more than just about the test tracks themselves. It's about the evolution of testing of vehicles. So, if I may really understand. This is uh, a tablature, I guess you'd call it, from ancient Assyria. Uh, and if you look here, you can see that the king is riding on a wheeled cart. It's kind of difficult to see, but the wheel is here, and this car is hunting bears or lions or something from this. Uh, from this cart, two wheel cart. So that's, uh, let's say, 3000 BC is the best guess of the date of this. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a Roman wheel uh, from 2000 years ago. Uh, and uh, you'll, if you notice, uh, you perhaps couldn't very well because that uh, the previous slide hard to see, but uh, this is a much heavier duty wheel than the earlier wheel, of, which was you know, 3,000 years earlier. So it tells you that along the way of carriages drawn by horses and other beasts of burden, there were changes that were going on in just the basic wheel. Next, please. So if we get down to the reasonably modern age and look at uh, a Studebaker carriage around uh, 110 years ago. This actually was the uh, carriage that President McKinley rode in from his home in whatever town it was he lived in in uh, Ohio to the railroad station to take the train to Buffalo where he was shot and died of his, of his wound. So this, uh, but notice on this, this carriage fairly delicate wheels. They're, they don't have big spokes, they don't have a lot of spokes. Uh, it's, it's lightweight, but it has many of the elements of the automobile, the motor car that is beginning to come in to use it in 1900. The springs, for example, and the basic chassis. Okay, next slide, please. On the other hand, a farm wagon of that same era or earlier as you see here, had much heavier duty wheels because it had to carry a heavy load. Now, somehow or other, over the centuries, the people who made wagons and carriages figured all of this out by the usual way of something broke, and they had to fix it and figure out why it broke. But that's the genesis of automotive engineering. Get to it. Okay, next. So, the next player in the in the development of the wheel was the bicycle. And the first bicycles were not bicycles you pedaled, but around 1820, amazingly enough, you pushed them with your wheel, uh, with your feet. So this was about uh, 1820, uh, these French dandies uh, pushing their uh, bicycles around. Next, please. And uh, in the 1880s, with the invention of the tires and so on, we got to modern bicycles, uh, bicycle races and so on, as shown here. Uh, and bicycling was very popular. It swept the country, it swept the world, in fact, about this time, 1880s, 1890s. Uh, that was important in laying the groundwork for the automobiles for, for two reasons. The bicyclists re, uh, demanded better roads, but also the, the, some of the mechanical stuff of the bicycles, the wheels, 
their gears, their steering, and so on. Again, and the tubular steel of their, of their frames uh, became applicable in the uh, early automobiles. Next, please. So here's a photograph of uh, Roy Chapin, the original Roy Chapin, uh, on a curved dash Oles. Uh, 1901, this was on a demonstration run from Detroit to New York City, and notice it has bicycle wheels. Yeah. And indeed, uh, the uh, Henry Ford's first experimental car in 1896, five years earlier, also had bicycle wheels. Next, please. Uh, on the other hand, the first Buick, which was also about the same time, had wagon wheels, yeah. which you can readily see were heavier. So in the early days of the auto industry, there was sort of a, uh, a contest between bicycle wheels or wagon wheels. Well, we can see how that how that evolved. Next, please. Uh, this, by the way, was the was the first the earliest photo I could find of so-called load testing. Uh, the identities rarely said gave the date or the approximate date and said it was on Riverside Drive. Well. <laughs> we don't know what Riverside Drive is. So Riverside Drive in New York or any any other city, which is practically all cities that had a, a Riverside Drive. But anyway, it was road testing uh, out in public. Next, please. The other thing that was going on in the early days was a question of whether a cross-country run was a demonstration or a test or, or some combination thereof. And the early automobile manufacturers did a lot of these things. They sponsored these, and they would go from here to San Francisco or from here to Mexico City and back, things like that. And uh, they, uh, of course, roads were pretty primitive, and uh, as you can see, these uh, Oldsmobiles got bogged down somewhere along the line. But you notice it has, whereas the Oldsmobile we looked at a, a couple of slides back had bicycle wheels, now it has wagon wheels. So it's evolving. Next, please. Uh, the next thing that happens in this evolution of the testing of these, by now, new mechanical marbles was laboratory testing. And this is a picture, uh, uh, I'm not sure at where, probably Chrysler or one of the Chrysler uh, routes uh, of an engine dynamometer about uh, 1911. Next picture. Dodge, when it got into this in 1914, making whole cars as opposed to just parts for Henry Ford, uh, actually had a test track out behind the, uh, uh, the Dodge main plant on Joseph Campbell in Hamtramck. However, that was not a test, a development test track. It was a, it was a track to make sure that the cars, when they came off the assembly line, actually worked before they shipped them to dealers for delivery to customers. So it's a, it's a difference. It is a test track, but Automotive proving grounds, which we'll see in a moment, were for developmental purposes, not to uh, find out before you ship something to the dealer uh, or a customer that it actually worked and didn't fall out the break. Next, please. The beginning of true automotive proving grounds, such as the guys here in the room and perhaps the wives or widows or daughters will remember, was. This car, the so-called Copper Cool Chevrolet of 1923, which turned out to be a disaster for General Motors and, and, and uh, Chevrolet in particular, because it had never been tested. It was, it was a, 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 one of these great ideas that came out of the uh, Dayton Research Laboratories under Boss Kettering, but, and uh, he sold the idea to the uh, General Motors Board of Directors, which authorized them to go into production on it without ever consulting the Chevrolet people. It was never tested. And what happened, it was, they, uh, they failed. The idea was if you had a, a copper cooled engine, uh, and I don't know all the technology of it, but you didn't have to have a radiator, which was a continual problem on old cars and, uh, and maybe on some modern ones too. So this car failed. <laughs> They built about 400 of them. They had to, uh, fortunately, most of them were still in company hands. 
they had to actually recall about 100 from customer hands. And, and uh, basically, they were never produced again or sold. This is in the Harry Court Museum. Next, please. Uh, these are the two guys uh, who then became the architects of the modern proving ground. Uh, uh, Alfred E. Sloan Jr. on the left, who was then, uh, I think, President of General Motors, later became chairman of the board for many years, and Boss Kettering, vice president of research for many years, on the, on the right. Now, Kettering, after this terrible failure of the Copper Cool Chevrolet, uh, offered to resign as a General Motors Vice President Director. And Sloan said, no, we, I mean, we, we respect you too much for that, but how are we going to avoid having this kind of thing happen to us in the future? And, and so they sat down and said, okay, we're going to have a proving ground where we can test all these cars before we put them into production. And furthermore, we can do it in secret without our competitors finding out what it is we're doing or running into problems doing these kinds of things on public roads. Because as roads get, got better in the 1920s, car speeds went up uh, and therefore there were more hazards to be experienced. So, next slide please. Uh, the General Motors Proving Ground at Milford uh, began uh, and uh, GM hired Con, over Con, to design the uh, 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 gatehouse for the proving grounds. It's still there as far as I know. Maybe some GM people here have seen it in recent years. Uh, but it was a you know, beautiful uh, gatehouse. It's very early. In 1924, as they started building proving grounds. Next week. Uh, they had to invent how to do uh, the roads in the first place because there were no high speed concrete turns on any American highways then. Yes, there were flat, straight stretches of concrete, the first one supposedly having been between uh, six and seven miles in Detroit in 1909. But if you, if you can imagine pouring wet concrete on a slope, the problem was how do you keep it from sliding down and puddling in the bottom. So General Motors had to, with its contractors, had to, had to figure out how to do this long before the, uh, the U.S. Bureau of uh, Highways had to do it. Next, please. Uh, the proving ground was 40 miles from the GM building in, uh, in Midtown Detroit. So uh, that's a long way in 1924. So they had actually built a dormitory out there for the drivers. And this was the, the dormitory. Next. And this was the dining room for the, for the drivers and the mechanics and the people who, uh, uh, in the early days. Next. And here's a shot of it. Uh, very quickly, it got very busy because uh, uh, General Motors was expanding rapidly. Uh, uh, those who are familiar with automotive history know that the General Motors quickly overtook Ford in production and sales, Chevrolet in particular and also had introduced in this time period two new brands of cars, the Pontiac and the LaSalle. So there was a great deal of, uh, of development work going on, and, and they needed this proving ground, and they got right to it. Next, please. Uh, one of the features that I found, which is common to every test track in the world, is the uh, water bath. Uh, and here was an early shot uh, Again, they didn't quite know what they were doing in this. I don't know what this guy on the right is doing. That splash one. Very graphic picture. They don't let them anywhere near anything like this anymore. Next, please. Uh, this is a, a uh, drawing of the General Motors proving ground uh, in, that, in that first year. Let me just point out a couple of things if I can step away and hear from you. Hear, hear me okay. Uh, this was farm country. And they were trying to have roads like the U.S. had it. So there are, there, there are gravel roads, there are paved roads, and hills, and so on, and some unfinished tracks on farm roads, and so on. But, and, a, and a long, high-speed straightaway, you see that at the top, running straight across the top. Uh, and this is labeled as a high-speed track, but that would be not as high speed as on that straightaway with the little loops at the end, the eye of the needle. 
but basically what they're doing is, is uh, running up miles, lots of miles under what they try to imagine are tough road conditions. The first technical road conditions and beyond that, tough ones. Next please. Uh, at the same time, uh, laboratory kind of testing continues, and this was an interesting shot showing, showing how Chrysler is developing the DeSoto for 1928 introduction, uh, had an outdoor artificial rain uh, setup shown here. And again, this was very common among various, all of the manufacturers. I've seen pictures of this from several manufacturers. Next week. And another type of testing which came in along this time is cycle testing. Now, this is still done, and the problem is how do you know, in this case, this gadget is opening and closing the door of the Studebaker in 1930. And, uh, uh, but how do you know how many times you need to open and close that door in order to make sure that the hinges and the latches stay glued together? And it's guesswork to begin with, but, but gradually, through failures, they find out. And over the years, I might say that the, the durability distances that, that cars under development have to pass the test has increased enormously for a variety of reasons. Uh, longer warranties, governmental regulations, competition, and so forth. Uh, back in the, uh, I'm working on an article now on a, on a car known as the Will St. Clair. And I discovered that in 1921, when that car was introduced, the warranty on it was 90 days. <laughs> and that was the standard, 90 days, or it was three months, or 3,000 miles. That was the standard up until 1961. Wow, really? That was it. Three, three, months, three months or 3,000 miles up until the warranty war ensued a little by four. Next, please. Uh, another evolution in this testing, lab testing, so to speak, was a, a shaker, a dynamometer shaker. Now, a dynamometer it spins the rear wheels to so, so the vehicle, rather than being out being driven around the test track, you put it on a ring like this and you turn the wheels, or you have the engine turning the wheels uh, to rack up the miles without it going anywhere. It doesn't even need, need a driver. And then they can introduce into that shaking mechanisms, as you can see, and the front isn't shaking at all, it isn't blurred at all, it's the rear that's, that's being bounced up and down. Uh, 1935, so you can see how this whole testing is evolving. Now in many cases these rigs were in, uh, were, uh, in the case of General Motors and Packard, which in 1935 and Studebaker, which had cooling grounds by that time, they, these would likely be in their, in their, in their proving grounds. But for Chrysler and Ford and others, uh, they were doing it in their garages and labs. Next, please. Uh, in the meantime, Milford uh, was expanding. Now, this is another shot of the, of the lodge, doubled in space by 1928. So from between 24 and 28, they had to double the space of the dormitory for the drivers. Next, please. And look how the uh, dining room give you an idea of how, how the explosion in this took place in the 1920s. Next, please. Uh, and again, the gatehouse, uh, nicely manicured, so to speak. Next, the, uh, this was the, the gas station at the Proving Ground, the GM Proving Ground. Nicely architected. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Next. Uh, the other thing is that the, the test engineers had to design and develop and invent their testing rigs. There was no precedence for any of this. And so here's one that tests steering hammer, 1924. I don't know how it worked, uh, but I have seen in my book, I have a picture of the same kind of thing in the 40s, in the late 40s. So it was, it was an important thing. And, and of course, power steering was unknown in those days, uh, so the steering effort was very important in reducing that steering effort. Drivers, <laughs> weaklings like me. 
whatever. It was very important in the development of the car. Next, please. Another uh, curious development was accurate measurement of the speed of the vehicle. Now, the early speedometers were attached to a gear on the, you go on your bottom the port, yeah. on the front right wheel, uh, but that wasn't necessarily absolutely accurate, which engineers required. They needed accuracy in the heat building. So the fifth wheel was built. And this is a very early version of it. You can see it's attached to the right rear wheel of this uh, truck chassis. Uh, and also, we've got sandbags in there to uh, uh, simulate the, the load in the truck. Again, inventing, uh, testing uh, uh, systems as they go along. Next. Now, this is a curious thing. Uh, if I hadn't told you what it was, you would never guess what that guy was lying on the front fender about. But what he was doing, if you look real carefully, you can see he's pouring water out of a pitcher or a can or something. And this is actually, and as, they, as the car, this Cadillac is driven around in a circle, they're using this by pouring water out uh, over the right front wheel. Then they go out and then measure the radius. And that's an important thing in, in car specifications, the turning, the turning circle. Next. And of course, meanwhile, on those gravel roads or mud roads, they're doing endurance <coughs> tests. Uh, I wish I could tell you how many miles they ran in those years, in the 20s, in their endurance tests. I don't know whether it was 1,000 miles or 5,000 miles. Uh, they're, now they're upwards of 100,000 miles. But they, nevertheless, they, they ran up. Uh, and they ran around the clock and in all kinds of weather, as you see here. So, that's it. Uh, Having the moving ground behind walls and, and uh, enable General Motors to, to have uh, a lot of events internal, mainly, like dealer meetings and personal meetings, or new car shows, where they could keep them secret and away from the eyes of, uh, of the news people and competitors. So this was an example of one of those in the, you can tell from the, from the square off most of the cars uh, in the 20s. Uh, you could also bring people in for demonstrations. These were uh, a Masonic group that were brought in in their white duck pants and mm -hmm. caps to for this demonstrate high speed demonstration of the 1928 Cadillac. Thanks. Uh, just working in the garages and just a shot there showing uh, working on the Cadillac V12 engine in uh, 1931. This is the kind of curious thing. It takes a long time to develop a new product in the auto industry, lead time, and you know you can easily put together why were they developing a, a much more expensive engine uh, when the depression was already upon us. Well, you know that's just uh, the way it goes. Sometimes you cannot you cannot anticipate those things. So they in 1928 it looked like a really really good idea to have a, a V12 Cadillac. And, the same for all the other major uh, luxury car makers at the time. Uh, but by the time 1932 came, the depth of the depression, they couldn't kill them. Next, please. Uh, handling uh, trials. Uh, the, the invention of a skid pan, just a big expanse of, of pavement. They pour water on it, and then they <coughs> drive cars onto it and try to make them skid. And these, these are handling tests. They're very important. Uh, and think that this was a, uh, would have been a much later development, but GM was doing it in the 30s, as you see. Next. Uh, <coughs> as the sophistication of all this improved, then they began collecting really rough roads from around the world. And all of the uh, automobile test tracks seem to have <coughs> the same kind of thing, Belgian block roads. <coughs> and you can see that this would be a very bumpy ride. But that's what they had to do, particularly when Detroit was selling a lot of cars overseas before World War II. Next, please. Uh, another thing, of course, is hill climbing. It was always important. Uh, you, if you remember, <coughs> I showed you that picture of the, uh, the test track behind the Dodge plant in 1914. 
in Antarctica, or we can artificial hill. Well, here's the real thing, the real hill out in the country in, in Wilford. 27% grades increased to grade, actually. Uh, and they, they got even steeper. Next, please. Uh, now let's turn to, to the next Detroit area test track, which was Packard. <coughs> Cadillac, or after General Motors came on, my uh, Cadillac's principal competitor was Packard. Yeah. This is just for people who don't know what a classic Packard looks like. Next, please. Uh, so Packard went out to Utica, not uh, uh, closer to the Packard plant than Milford was with the GM headquarters, and built this, this oval track mainly for high speed runs. But also, you can see the uh, off to the to the top and also the bottom corner here. They had other roads for different kinds of, of roadways and testing and so on. Uh, there was a lot of lore went into this track. It was they designed it to be the highest speed track and immediately set out to set speed records at it. Like that. Right down on the left, that's the gate between 22 and 23 on Bend. Yeah, yeah. The Where entrance. That of trees. Yeah, the, the entrance Thank is, is over That's here. still there as yeah. a museum. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Excuse me. That's good. Thanks, please. Uh, in fact, at that, in those gatehouses, again, beautifully architected and beautifully built uh, garages. This is the garage. Uh, And they also had a dormitory, even though they were only 20 miles out. 20 miles was a long way in 1947. Next, please. Uh, during the <laughs> war, uh, you'll notice I haven't said anything about Chrysler. Chrysler didn't have a proving ground, but Chrysler was making tanks, manufacturing tanks at their new tank plant over the war. And uh, the tanks had to be tested just like anything else on wheels or tracks, as this may be. So, Chrysler rented the Packard Proving Ground uh, from Packard to test their tanks for the Army. And here was a shot of that uh, during the war. Uh, as it happens, those tanks just tore up the track, something terrible, tore down the surface of the concrete, as you can imagine. And so Packard had to rebuild it after the war, presumably us taxpayers. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, Ford. Uh, Confining ourselves for the moment to the Detroit area test tracks. Ford was the next to have a test track. It had uh, the Ford Airport right in right in Durham. Oh. And so in 1937, after the after the five years after Ford got out of building Tri-Border airplanes and uh, and it no longer operated in essence a, a private commercial airport, uh, they turned it in 1937, they turned it into a test track. And I'll just point out a couple of landmarks here. Uh, this is Dearborn Inn. Uh, by that time, of course, the Henry Ford Museum and so on had been built over here. Uh, and this uh, is uh, uh, Oakwood. This is Rotunda. And of course, you can go out there right now and see the walls. It's still there. They modernized it. But it is, it's much smaller. It was much smaller when it opened. Uh, I think uh, less than 10% of the size of the GM track, but it had the advantage of being right there in Durham. They didn't have to drive 40 miles to it. They didn't have to build a motor for the drivers. So uh, it was right there. And they, and they managed to put in all the other kinds of things, as you can see in this label. Next, please. Now, this is a shot of, uh, of the cold room uh, testing in 1938 and forward. Uh, and this was built into one of the old aviation building plants. There were two big buildings there on the airport where they built tri-motors. And this was, and one of them they put all these labs in, and the other one they used for development, or just a developmental garage, and can still do it for that matter. If you look, if you drive past and look real closely at those buildings today, you can see the, uh, that they were the old airplane hangars. Next, please. And after the war, Ford uh, built its own artificial hill uh, in, on the Durban Test Track. And again, I'll just point out a couple of these things. Here is the Independence Hall replica at Greenfield Village, or Henry Ford Museum. 
Over here are these old airframe buildings, and that's the original tower from the uh, when it was an active airport. Okay, that was, uh, now since it was so close, Ford could use it for a lot of things, including it was very handy when they had a prominent journalist come in uh, to test a new car. And here is uh, Tom McCahill of uh, Mechanics Illustrated, the bald guy, the driver door with a 65 Comet and the chief engineer, uh, Howard Frears, who's still around, still a good friend of mine, on the right. Uh, so it's a very handy thing to have this track right there. Uh, and I was on it many, many times, both as a journalist and later as the PR guy. Mm -hmm. uh, next, please. Uh, Chrysler, despite its engineering reputation, did not have its own proving ground. But I did find this picture of Chrysler uh, using just fields out behind the Dodge truck plant uh, in, in Mount Road and whatever it is along there. Yeah. These are 1939 Chrysler driving through the mud. Uh, and uh, one thing or another, next please. After the war, Chrysler began building its own test track out at uh, Chelsea. This is a picture of them clearing uh, the trees so that the you know, woods around there to build this test track next. And here's a diagram of the test track when they had uh, uh, completed it. Uh, it was opened in 1954 when Chrysler was at one of its peaks. And, uh, and again, it has all the, the, the oval track, the high speed track, the various ride driving tracks, hills, gravel. Uh, Etc. All that stuff. Like that. That's I ninety four on the right. Nowadays. Uh, yes, yeah. it would be out out here. So I ninety four east west. Yeah. Uh, next please. <laughs> and Ford, uh, along about that time, also decided to have another and bigger track. And the old timers at Ford tell me that they they carefully designed the thing to be at least. Uh, so many square feet larger than the GM truck. <laughs> that was the order of the day. I don't know where that extra footage is or acreage or whatever it is. This was a, it was the it was the Fisher Farm, the Fisher family of General Motors body fame. This was the farm of one of them. And so Ford was able to get this fairly easily. They got the whole thing just for you. One ownership. Uh, and again, it's like the other tracks, it's got all the bells and whistles, straightaways speed tracks, durability modes, and so forth. Next, here's a shot out there. You can see it's out in the country. Got uh, into the woods, but it's, it's, it's basically the, at this point of this time. Now, this is still before the interstate highway system. This is 1955, 56. So the interstate highways, which introduced a whole new challenge for our one engineers because of the high speeds involved and the long distances that were you know, near then available. Next please. Now just to give you an idea of where these tracks are located, if you're not familiar with them, again the first one here's 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 Detroit, here's this one, here's where we are. Here's 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 Milford here. And the second track is Utica here. The third track is that Ford Dearborn. The fourth one is Chelsea out here, and then uh, the Roman Improvement Ground Four right here. Next, please. Uh, in the uh, 50s, early 50s, General Motors uh, really uh, was suc successfully introduced automotive air conditioning in the marketplace among, 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 uh, among a number of other advances to make motoring more pleasurable. Our steering, our brakes, our windows, etc. air conditioning. So to improve out air conditioning, they, had to, they decided they had to have a desert moving ground. So they went outside of, uh, of Phoenix uh, and built this part of the and built this Mesa moving <coughs> ground. Uh, next, please. And again, they could use it for special events. Uh, this was, they unveiled their uh, Firebird 3 uh, 
turbine powered car, like, a, like an airplane engine, jet engine, for the GM's 50th anniversary. I'm probably there in that picture. No, I can't be in the picture because I took it. Really <laughs> I was there, I witnessed it. <laughs> Thanks, please. Uh, Ford <laughs> shortly did the same thing. They went out in the desert, but more for, uh, in Arizona, uh, it was a mountainous part, the Mesa, uh, south of, the southeast of Phoenix is all a flat desert. Northwestern Arizona is quite mountainous, and Ford was developing heavy trucks, and they needed to test them over the mountainous roads, and so Ford built this turning ground at Kingman, which is the northwestern corner of Arizona. Curiously, they sold it to Chrysler, just a couple of years ago, uh, Chrysler also built a proving ground outside of Phoenix, but it was so close to Phoenix, the land became so valuable for real estate development that Chrysler bailed out of it uh, for considerable profit uh, and then bought the Ford proving ground. Why Ford decided they didn't need it anymore, I don't know. I've never been able to get a good answer, but they did. But for one thing, they got out of the heavy truck business. Next, please. Now, let's turn briefly, I'm close to the end, uh, to a, a couple of, you know, broadly speaking, Detroit automobile companies and their tracks. Studebaker also built a track in 1927, same year that Packard did, in three years after the General Motors. It was uh, said that they uh, they built the world's largest sign. Which said Studebaker in terms of, uh, they, I don't know whether they put in evergreens or whatever it is, but they put in a, a, a woods but arranged the trees in such a way that an aerial photograph would have the, the word Studebaker in it. <laughs> uh, that now, that track is now being used by some automotive supplier company, I forgot which one. Next, please. And Nash built one. Ceased as, as a as a venue. 
for horse automobile racing. racing and horse racing in 1911, in 19, from 1911 to 1919, Chalmers and uh, Hudson and Hop used it as a test, uh -huh. as a test track. Okay. Now, that would be the granddaddy of, of everything that, that you've shown here. That would be the granddaddy. Right. There's a picture in the New York Times that was taken in, in 1909 showing Chalmers automobiles being tested on that track. And, and it says it in the, in the headline for that piece. You know, I, I think Nick, there's, there may be some photographs of that in the NHC collection if you look in the, in the Chalmers file. The problem with a lot of those photographs is that, you know, they're not identified. You don't know when they were or where right. they were. Right. And right. you would probably recognize those. Well, the characteristics. As an but I'll tell you, coming up here from Kentucky, I don't have that kind of institutional knowledge to do that. They, 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 essentially, essentially, though, that, that uh, a concept of testing a vehicle, and because of the proximity, when, when the quarter, Jefferson Quarter, opened up for manufacturing, it was convenient. It, it was there. So to take the car out of the out of the factory after production, drive it around that mile track, and, and it was a little more intense. The, the picture that was in the New York Times is a little more intense. It shows these Chalmers vehicles really going to it uh, on, on that track. And well, it's a back to track. The, the basic question of whether these were developmental testing or prove out testing after after assembly. And my, my guess could very well. Or, or, or very well. The, the actual endurance of the vehicle to to, to sustain. Uh, viability, uh, you know, as you as you said, there's a 90-day warranty on the vehicle. They're, they're they're squeezing everything out of that thing to see if they actually if they don't fall apart on the track. Uh, I mean, exactly. Uh, essentially, essentially, with the Ford Winton race, the Ford Winton race on the on the on the eighth lap of that race, Winton's car broke down. Oh, here's an Henry Ford one. And, and Henry Ford won. He won. But regardless of the circumstances, Ford won. But Winton's car essentially gave up. It gave up, and, and the, the proof of the pudding is that Winton had the prestige, and the and the and the, yeah, the mark. He had a production. Yeah, they built several right. hundred cars. At least. Right, right. So his his reputation was really on the line. But and Winton it, was a Cleveland manufacturer. For those of you who are right, Lakewood, Ohio. Oh. But the the, the 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 situation there is that it, it, it introduced it that here in, in Detroit. There there had been auto racing in, already in Rhode Island and already in Chicago. They had, they had already started auto racing. But this was the, the first event here at, at, that, at that track, and it was the first place where these manufacturers, as I mentioned, had an opportunity because of the convenience. The track was there, and, the, and these uh, facilities were all around it. They used it. Well, and, and of course, there, were, there used to be a lot of horse tracks around. I mean, Indian Village, as I recall, that was the was first. A, was, a, was a horse track. That, that, that was the first. Ford's Island Park plant. Was on the side of That's the, correct. the horse track and so on. Uh, and of course, racing. <laughs> We've all seen the great scene in uh, the, the, the movie. Uh, oh, no, 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 oh, no, 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 The chariot races. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ben -Hur. Ben -Hur. Ben -Hur. Ben -Hur. Yeah. 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 Late night will love it. So this goes back. I mean, man yeah. will race. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. He has yeah. raced. <laughs> yes, sir. Bill. No. If I question the. Um, once, once these proving grounds were, were built, my, my guess is that the drivers were probably instructed to, to really push the limits of, of testing of these cars. And so I'm, I'm assuming that there were probably a lot of accidents. No, you ever find no, any to the contrary, there? safety was always really? a big uh, issue for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, I mean, you didn't want to uh, destroy a test car that maybe cost a million dollars. So. And, and they weren't, the, the driving that they did, at least in the, uh, once GM established the proving ground and, the, you know, scads of real engineers, everything they did was prescribed. Uh, you, uh, you drive for uh, two miles, or 40 miles an hour, and apply the brakes, start up again, you know, things like that. Even today, the, if you've wondered perhaps how does the uh, Environmental Protection Agency determine what mileage your car gets, it goes on the new car sticker, you know, does your city mileage, highway mileage, average, and so on. How do they do that? Well, 
It's based upon a test cycle which goes back to somebody imagining what a commuting driver in Los Angeles in the early 60s would drive. In other words, they, they take that, so to speak, and that became the basis for all future emission and eventually fuel economy testing. And it, you know, you, you start out and you go a block and you, you, shift, you stop and you shift gears or let the automatic do its work and you turn right and you turn left and you, and you get on the freeway for a couple of miles and off and you see the track. It's that kind of thing. So, and it's, and it's prescribed and it's because it's meant to try to duplicate the, uh, the real world. So they don't push them. There have been accidents, there have been fatal accidents uh, on test tracks that I, I know of. I don't know all the details, but I know they have, they have happened. But those are, considering the number of miles driven, and the fact that dealing with uh, unproven vehicles, because the purpose is to prove it, of course, uh, the, the rate is very low. In my book, I've got, uh, I, I think I, there's a picture in there at the Chrysler Google Ground showing the uh, stop sign and so on that don't do this, and, you know, don't do that kind of thing. They're, they're, it is tricky. It is very tricky. And the, and the drivers require training. It's very boring during this, during this durability testing. The biggest problem is driver going to sleep, of course. So they, um, again, I think there's a photograph in there showing the schedule that they'll drive for however long time, and they've got to come in and rest, maybe change drivers, another driver in that car, and so on. It's, the whole thing is scripted to avoid having accidents. Yes, ma'am. Were there also um, cold weather? Say again? Proving grounds, cold weather in mm -hmm. Arizona? Oh, yes. Run. Well, Yes, there were uh, uh, Bemidji, Minnesota, was, it was decided by Ford at least, was the coldest place in the United States. And uh, this is somewhere uh, north of Duluth, if you're familiar with the area. It's up in the iron mining area, the pellet mining, pellet mining area. Now. And uh, Ford had a test station up there. I, I believe the General Motors had one and may still have one in Canada, just as an example. In the book, I've got one, of, I didn't know whose it was, probably a, a vendor of some kind, or maybe just a track for rent, someplace in northern Michigan. I couldn't even find out where. So Here's Saint, the picture. So St. Marie. Possibly? Yeah. Chrysler? Uh, no, or Rockwell, just a, Rockwell International used to test their truck axles up there. I couldn't tell who Ford got that. It was on farm fields around. Uh, so, yes, there was that. A lot of it I think they can do in the lab. It's like the desert stuff, and now, GM sold its base on, you know, after Chrysler sold its uh, Phoenix track for the big bucks, GM uh, sold theirs out to the Mesa for the big bucks, thinking that they could duplicate it down in Mexico. And it turned out, as I understand it, the Mexican government wouldn't allow them to do it. Mexico is very tough for Americans and American companies to own property. So GM had to come back and rent their track back from the people that sold it. I understand that's now whatever it is, they settle that or they don't do that anymore. The foreign companies coming in here from Germany and from uh, uh, Japan, a lot of them settle down in uh, uh, the uh, Mojave Desert, uh, have a desert track, and uh, Honda, of course, uses a track uh, that was built by the state of Ohio, which happens to be close to where the Honda plants are in middle Ohio. I just didn't, uh, the way it goes with a book like this, you've only got so many pages, and uh, you, know, you, can't add, you can't add pages. The, the publisher says you've got X number of pages, you've got to tell your story of all the pictures and within those bounds. And so that's the way it goes. So I didn't, I didn't explore further. I had one example of a picture I had, which was the Mercedes proving ground in Stuttgart. One of the problems in uh, Europe and in Japan Lands, this is not available. Uh, now, if you travel through, I don't know about Japan, but if you travel through Europe, there's lots of land, but it's owned by somebody, and you just can't go and buy it because it's been in the same family for a thousand years or something. So it's very difficult to build a proving ground like that. Even Ford had one uh, in Belgium, I think, uh, and uh, but a, a lot of it. Uh, Lindbergh and his involvement with the uh, tractor proving ground on Shelby? 
Well, Colonel, what was his name? <laughs> anyway, the, the, the chief engineer of Packard was a, had been active in the development of an aircraft engine for World War I, which was a joint project of all, okay. all the automobile companies. It's in the Packard section, oh, okay. sort of the Packard chapters. And out of this grew Colonel, whatever his name is, he's the chief engineer of Packard. And he was very much interested in aviation. Some of the early pictures of the Packard Brewing Ground, they actually there's a picture of the uh, of an airplane racing a Packard. Uh, <laughs> Ford had purchased that. Vincent, that was his name. Yeah, Colonel 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 Jesse Vincent, uh, and he was a big racing enthusiast. They were trying to develop a diesel aircraft engine at Packard in those days, the twenties. Didn't succeed. I don't know why. I, I didn't, uh, there wasn't a picture of it anyway. That I, you know, this this is a picture. Of <laughs> that was a, the story depends upon the pictures. Ford, Ford had given the Packard Club that seven acres sold the other seven, and they moved that hangar yeah. over yeah. onto the property. Yeah. So that's all part of the yeah. museum. When, when Packard went on their yeah. merge with Studebaker in the mid fifties, Curtis Wright took over the property, okay. yeah. so and they didn't do anything with it. And Ford wanted a modern factory, which was on the northwest corner of that property, and just in front of the square mile. Yeah, it became Utica Trim. But Ford had no use for the track. They already had three tracks. And uh, so it was never used. And eventually, uh, they uh, sold it to a real estate developer. But they pulled away the, the parts that had those gorgeous Albert Kahn garages and, mm -hmm. and lodge and so on, and gave that to the Utica uh, Civic Organization. Yeah, there's lots of little stories in it. One of the, the doors from the, where it said Packard on the Boulevard, 1907, and one of those two incredible Packard uh, limestone grills above the Boulevard uh, went out there. And they're going to be on display. So we're doing a real nice job out there. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, a comment. I thought you implied that the tank track was an automotive track uh, and had to be rebuilt because of the tank. That's, that's not true. That, that was all farmland before the war, and the tank track was put in when the building was built. I oh, well, no, I'm talking the, yeah, the, the picture I showed was of, 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 of an M3 Sherman on the Packard Proving Ground with a fifth wheel. They used that too, yeah. And I, uh, I can't remember more recent track vehicles that had rubber pads well, on it's not I think the, 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 ones, the they World War II, didn't yeah. they were steel no, tracks? No, 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 they had rubber. Did they? Sure. They sure well, did. whatever. Uh, I, I, I've got a picture in the book of well, somebody examining the track after the war, and it's a mess. It's mm -hmm. a rough. Well, I, I mean, that track was rebuilt. I don't know how many times. The, eight, the Sherman was 38 tons. The Abrams was over 70. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know how many times that oh, was that's right. taken that's out right. and, and that's right. uh, what For whatever reason, uh, they, they blamed it on the tanks. Yeah. <laughs> the German tanks never used rubber pads, and the, the American tanks always, always had rubber pads. That's I, I didn't know that. I, I never thought to try to find out. I, in fact, I was in an armored fuel artillery unit so between the wars, National Guard, and uh, I don't even remember. I even got uh, still got the service manual for it. I don't remember whether that was based upon. Maintenance manuals. There were um, procedures for taking out every other pad. You know, if you were in a, a situation where you, uh, well, not necessarily swamp. But, yeah. uh, well, they would, uh, you know, if they ran them with those steel tracks on an uh, asphalt pavement, they would certainly do damage. Thirty-eight tons or seventy-six well, tons. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Why would they use them? Yeah. Right. I, I, when I was in the college graduate program at Ford, at Lavoie Transmission. They had built tanks here, they said, in the Korean War. Did you see any of that? Because they had a test track alongside that plant. Too. Well, I didn't, yeah, a lot of plants had small, had, yeah, the Lonely Transmission at Ford had a small track. Uh, the one time Hitzel Division, which is right off the edge of 94, uh, in Rouge, uh, had a small test track. Uh, but those, I think, were more of the sort of quick and dirty and post assembly type things. Now, in the assembly plants themselves, they put in these chairs.
chassis roll dynamometers to run it off the test track and then put it on the chassis roll dynamometer running some distance. And I know in, in the case of uh, when Lincoln went from a uh, three months warranty to a 24 month warranty in 1960, for 61 models, uh, they figured that they would try to get that under control by having a, a road test every Lincoln that came out of Wixon. I don't know for how many miles or whatever, but just to sort of assure themselves that they weren't shipping something. And it goes back to that Dodge plant 1914. And, and in fact, all the manufacturers still do that kind of thing. They pull cars out uh, and, and plant manual data home and manufacturing manual data home and make sure they, they're okay. And in fact, Chrysler had a big lawsuit years ago because somebody objected because their new Chrysler had no miles on it that it should have had for a new car. <laughs> Lawyers trying to have a people leave it. So. Chrysler used to drive the Vipers down Lake Shore when they when the Viper was first coming. <laughs> Every one of them. The, 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 you had just tried on Who could drive the car that day? They only did that kind of thing at night on Woodward Avenue. According to legend. <laughs> Other questions? We're going to want to invite you.